Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from 100 years ago, read some of the articles and comment on the ones I find interesting. In this episode, the week ending the 28th of January 1923, Moltke speaks despite being dead, Croydon decides, someone close to drugs prohibition advocates legalisation, we learn about Soviet education, Hitler organises a demo, and a chauffeur gets away with it. Not in this episode, for reasons of time, ignorance or sloth, a French royalist has been murdered. They're considering, and when this is in Britain, they're considering introducing a fuel duty uh, in re- to replace a uh, road tax. Um, got some bad news about that. And in the Ruhr, um, there's been a trial of uh, industrialists who haven't uh, been cooperating with the French. The mark has lost something like two thirds of its value in a week. And there's a fair amount of importation of British coal uh, going on, which uh, I'm sure the French are not particularly happy about. Now, at the beginning of the First World War, the chief of staff, the um, general of the German army, was a chap called Helmut von Molke. Now, things didn't go very well in in terms of his plans, uh, and uh, he was relieved in uh, September of 1914. And then he died in early 1916, if I remember correctly. And now his widow has cobbled together papers, letters, anything she can find and put it into a book, and this has been published. This is what The Times has to say about it. This is from Monday the 22nd of January. General von Moltke, as all men know, was chief of the German general staff in the years immediately preceding the outbreak of the war, in 1914, and was therefore responsible not only for the general plan of campaign, but for any changes in it which might become necessary by unforeseen events. The opening moves of the war did not result exactly according to plan, and on the afternoon of September the 14th, von Moltke received a message from the Kaiser through General von Linke, stating that since his health did not seem sufficiently robust to enable him to continue in control of the operations, he was to report himself sick and returned to Berlin. This is somewhat at variance with the account that's given in Annika Mombauer's biography of Moltke. The way she has it is that for a while, it may have been as much as a month, I can't quite remember, the, Germany effectively had two chiefs of the general staff. They had officially von Moltke and unofficially uh, a chap called Falkenhayn, Erich von Falkenhayn. Not that it matters too much. He was removed. It goes on. It is very evident that the personal reminiscences of the deceased general, supported by contemporary documents, ought to provide a really valuable contribution to the literature of the war. But the work as edited and arranged by his widow, and published as she admits in defiance of his wishes, is of greatly varying interest, while the arrangement leaves a good deal to be desired. Well, that may be, but I'm awfully glad uh, that she went to the effort. Uh, There are far too many generals who had lots of papers and all of them destroyed on their death, and they were destroyed, and that is a great loss to historians. It goes on. In a memorandum of July the 28th, 1914, von Moltke expresses the opinion that the Austrian-Serbian trouble was in itself purely a local one, and that but for Russian intervention there would have been no possible disturbance of the European peace. Well, there's a bit more that he says in that particular memorandum. He also said that should the Russians mobilise, the Germans would also have to mobilise immediately. Having said that, this does seem to be at variance with the theory that there was a plot. Now, this all goes back to the to a a meeting that took place in December 1912. And the theory about this is that this was the moment where Germany decided to go to war. The reason being because it could see that Russia was building up its forces and it believed that within a few years it just would not be able to to resist. So they thought, well, we'd better go to war, you know, while, while we're still ahead. And, but... The problem here is that Molka seems to be less belligerent than you might think, if that were true. So I don't know. 
I don't know, but that's the problem with the First World, World War. You often don't know. Uh, I, I've had my views changed many, many times. Uh, and this is just one of them. Anyway, it goes on. As to the action of England, von Moltke regards it as open to doubt whether she would have at once declared war as she did had not the neutrality of Belgium been violated, but he considers that she would in any case have intervened had France at any time been threatened with a disaster. Of course, Germany was threatening France with a disaster within a matter of weeks, so Britain would have had to have got its uh, skates on. It goes on. The plans for a campaign in the West, drawn up by Schlieffen, had provided for an advance by the German right wing through the south of Holland. When von Moltke took over from Schlieffen, he amended this plan so as not to bring Holland on the side of Germany's enemies, and he arranged that the right of the German advance would pass through the narrow neck between Aix-la-Chapelle and the southern frontier of Limburg. Did Holland matter much here? I know very little about the Dutch armed forces. All I know is that in the Second World War they collapsed within something like six days. Whether they would have been any better in the First World War, well, I see no reason to think they would have been, and so would have been less of a threat. Although maybe given the direction of Germany's thrust and uh, Holland being there in the flanks, maybe Malka just took the view that it wasn't worth bothering with. It's perfectly possible that the uh, Schlieffen plan, or Moltke plan, depending on your point of view, uh, wouldn't have worked under any circumstances. Anyway, it goes on. The violation of Belgium was necessary, he declares. Not, as other Germans have stated, because it was needed to forestall France, which had the same intentions, but to force the French armies from their own well-defended frontier into the open field, where they could more easily be met and defeated, and where, so von Moltke decisively states, they would have been early overwhelmed but for the prompt and invaluable assistance afforded by the British army. Hum. I very much doubt that the British army was a big factor in German considerations at any point in the Marne campaign. The British army was, in comparison to the French and German armies, tiny, so I very much doubt that it played a big part at any point in the fighting. But what he says about the French armies leaving their their forts effectively is interesting because of course in reality that's what they did. They pushed on into Alsace Lorraine and when they realized that the Germans were making a big thrust into Belgium they attempted to strike them in the flanks. This was uh, in the Battle of the Ardennes, in, I think, the 22nd of August, 1914. That, that ended in disaster. Um, uh, a chap called Simon House has written a very detailed account of, of how that disaster unfolded. But, yeah, the, the, the French weren't sticking to their forces. In, sorry, the, the French weren't sticking to their, their forts in uh, 1914. Whether, of course, Moltke would have known that as he was drawing up his plans is, of course, another question. What is interesting is he's not talking about a vast wheeling manoeuvre which is going to take Paris or or, or thrust through to the west of Paris and and, and capture the uh, French armies in a a big uh, battle of encirclement, a line that gets repeated so often. It goes on. Von Moltke tells us some stories about the Kaiser which make it clear that the warlord had extraordinarily little grasp of the conduct of operations on the grand scale. When, the day before mobilisation, there seemed to be some hope that France would stand aside in a war between Russia and the Central Powers, the Kaiser naively remarked, then we can now march the whole army eastward, and seemed unable to realise that millions of men cannot be moved like counters. This is another rather dubious statement. First of all, because surely any army should have some flexibility built into its war planning. There is no certainty that France will come to Russia's aid. Another point is that I believe that one of the generals in the logistics department of the German general staff actually wrote a book after the war. It's a chap called uh, von Staub, I think, uh, stating or claiming that he could easily have uh, 
you know, changed the uh, arrangement so that uh, the Germans went east rather than west. So I'm a bit dubious about that particular claim. Anyway, it goes on. Then on September the 7th came the news that the First Army was in straits, and thereupon followed the mission of Colonel Hench, about which so much has been written by historians of and commentators on the war. Von Moltke distinctly states that Hench was merely to inquire into the situation at the headquarters of the First and Second Armies. He had no authority to order the retirement of either. At the most, he was merely to inform the First Army that in the event of its not being able to stand its ground, it was to withdraw to the line soissons fim so as to again to join to the right of the Second Army. Now, there's a lot to explain here. The First and Second Armies were on the very rightmost of the right wing of the uh, German armies going through Belgium and then northern France. And they they got to a situation where their supplies and the attrition of battle was start, starting to affect them. And Moltke sends von Hench on a mission. Now, we don't know what orders were von Hench was given. What we do know is that uh, certainly Molka has become the scapegoat for the failure of the Marne campaign. And Hench is becoming another scapegoat, or perhaps but it might be better to describe him, as, uh, describe him as the scapegoat scapegoat. Anyway, he was sent off and he said, look, we've got to withdraw. This isn't, this isn't going to work. And that was the end of the, the Stephen plan, the Molka plan, call it what you will. It's perhaps worth pointing out that um, if you want to find a scapegoat, it, uh, it helps if they're dead. And both Moltke and Hench died during the war. Anyway, if you want to know more about the, the Marne campaign, uh, I would ch I'd recommend checking out one of um, Ross Beadle's uh, videos. I don't know if I mentioned him last week, but yeah, he's, he's very good. I'll uh, leave a link in the description. Well, Moltke's problem was things getting in the way. Croydon finds itself in a similar situation. This is from Friday the 26th of January. The local government electors of Croydon, men and women, have been summoned to the poll today to vote whether or not the Whitgift Hospital shall be removed in order that a local highway may be widened. The polling booths, of which there are 43, remained open until 8 o'clock and the result of the ballot will be made known tomorrow morning. The electors number 84,503. Wow, a, a local referendum. I thought they, that was a modern thing, but apparently not. Anyway, so what happened? Uh, this is from Saturday the 27th. The result of the poll of the Croydon municipal electors on the question of whether the council should proceed with the promotion of a bill in Parliament for the street widening scheme, which would entail the removal or demolition of the Whitgift Hospital, was declared yesterday. The figures were as follows. For demolition... 8,379 against 6,514, which is a majority of 1,865. You will notice that only about one in five of Croydon's electorate could be bothered to vote. But still, an interesting result. They, I mean, this, by the way, the Whiskey Gift Hospital, which is was about 300 years old at this stage. And Croydon is not exactly... You know, jam-packed with historic buildings so they obviously really wanted wanted a, a, a wider road and obviously it was part of what people did in those days I mean these days a building like that would be uh, part of the listing scheme it would be either grade one listed or grade two listed which essentially means you can't touch it but in those days well people like progress um, spoiler alert, as it happens, the Whitgift Hospital, now known as the Whitgift Arms Houses, why they changed the name, I don't know, it's still there. So the will of the people has been ignored. But then progress isn't always all it's cracked up to be. This is from Thursday the 25th of January. And this is from Peking. Much comment has been provoked by the speech made last night by the Inspector General of Customs at a meeting of the directors of the International Anti-Opium Association. Sir Francis Aglin referred to the demoralisation of his service. 
brought about by the immense rewards which were earned by some of the subordinate staff for the detection of smuggled opium, which had compelled him at one point on the Yangtze to discourage interference with the illicit traffic on the ground that the business of the customs was to collect duties, not to act as police. I must confess, this is really rather confusing. What is, I mean, if it's a, he's a Sir, Frank, Sir Francis Aglin here, well, that sounds pretty British to me. So what's he doing collecting customs on the Yangtze, which is a Chinese river? Well, who knows? Anyway, he is. It goes on. As an instance of the, the temptation to which the service was exposed, he mentioned the case of an official who was offered $200,000, about £25,000, no it isn't, it's about £40,000, to overlook a large consignment of heroin. It was generally known, the Inspector General said, that great quantities of opium were grown up country and smuggled into the wealthy cities in violation of the law with the connivance of the provincial and military officials. The illicit growth, transport and consumption had become a serious problem, and the question arose whether the Chinese government should not recognise an evil that seemed ineradicable from China, create a monopoly of the drug, and licence users at rates, of course, as nearly prohibitive as practicable. So, then as now we have someone who is close to the drugs industry, is trying to prevent uh, the, the traffic in drugs, essentially saying legalise it. Although it's perhaps worth pointing out that there was some pushback on this and some of the Chinese officials at this meeting said, look, this is all to do with our civil war, effectively, and that once that ends, everything will be fine. I have my doubts on that, but anyway, I don't know. Maybe what they need is communism, because everything gets better under communism. This is also from Thursday the 25th of January. The Moscow Revolutionary Tribunal is now trying the principles of the first experimental educational commune for children, opened under the auspices of the Commissariat for Education in March 1920. The Commissariat for Education secured for this children's institute, which was to care for and educate peasant orphans, a farm near Moscow and a house in the town. All the necessary running expenses were paid for by the same commissariat. At the preliminary investigation, appalling conditions were revealed, and although they did not differ essentially from those prevailing in other schools, attention was drawn to this particular case by the fact that one of the members, Vostyasensky, was found to be of unsound mind and had to be removed to an asylum. Apparently, the accidental publicity given to the matter caused the authorities to hold the inquiry, which revealed the fact that the children were starved to such a degree that they had to rely upon the charity of villagers near the farm, that they had been widely infected with venereal disease, and that the food purchased for their consumption had been systematically resold by the principals at a large profit. Um, for those of you, I don't know, does everyone know what venereal disease is? Because um, it's not a term in, in current use, it, it's, it's a sexually transmitted disease. The thing about this story is that, um, apart from it, it just how disgusting it is, is how similar this is to recent stories I've heard about conditions in the Russian army. Wouldn't happen in the Hitler Youth. This is from Saturday the 27th of January. A state of siege has been proclaimed for the part of Bavaria, east of the Rhine, as distinct from the Palatinate. This measure has been taken by the Bavarian government after consultation between its representative, Dr. Schwer, Minister of the Interior, and the central government. Um, I wasn't quite sure what they meant by the Palatinate here. It turns out that in those days there was part of Bavaria which was not connected with the rest of Bavaria, which is over in the west, um, to the west of the Rhine, the Palatinate. Anyway, it goes on. The demonstration called for tomorrow by the so-called fascisti was forbidden by the government in view of the possibility that it might lead to disorder and the desirability of Germany presenting a united front during the present crisis. Herr Adolf Hitler, the leader of the fascisti, vowed, however, that the demonstration would be held at all costs. It's interesting here that I mean, often people will say Hitler and the National Socialists weren't 
fascists. But it, it, is, it is interesting that as soon as they appear, and as soon as they start appearing in the, the pages of the Times, that is precisely what they're referred to as. Anyway, if he does go ahead with this demonstration and he's arrested, he's going to need an accommodating judge, like this one. This is from Wednesday the 24th of January. At Marleybone Police Court yesterday, the magistrate, Mr Simmons, consented to the withdrawal of the charges against Cyril Evans, 43 chauffeur, of being drunk while in charge of a motor car and causing grievous bodily harm to a Mrs Ballon by furious driving. Mr Musket for the police said the woman had died since the accident and at the inquest the jury returned a verdict of accidental death. After full consideration it was clear that neither of the charges against the defendant could be sustained. The doctor, in view of the defendant's history, had substantially modified his views as to Evans's condition, and it appeared that the woman was the worse for drink when the accident happened. There are a few things to point out from this. I mean, the first is that I had long thought that a drunk drive charge could not be proved prior to the introduction of the breathalyzer in 1968. I think it was 1968. But obviously they could, and they, they, they could be brought... But the really interesting thing about this is how could a doctor change his diagnosis or his assessment of the chauffeur's state on the basis of the the chauffeur's history? What's that got to do anything, what with anything? And also, why would his drunkenness be affected by the um, the victim's drunkenness? That seems very odd. Anyway, that's all for this week. I aim to have something up next week, but I promise nothing.